in this slot, we will uh, just wrap up, with, essentially wrap up our discussion of the basics of the Hadoop MapReduce by giving the actual computational part of, 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 of uh, the Hadoop framework, which is MapReduce. Um, and a little bit of history, uh, it all sort of started with Google. I remember when I was a PhD student and uh, searching for papers using Yahoo uh, search engine. And my colleague came to me and said, uh, have you tried this search engine that's called Google? And I said, I've never heard of it. Uh, but I gave it a go and it was, it was very much better than, than, you know, than, than Yahoo. And so that's what I used from then on. And a lot of people found out the same experiences because they're, you know, they're not just indexing and providing a, a basic kind of keyword search, but they're, they're doing a lot of ranking as well. They're doing a lot of processing of the data that they're stored. Um, so, so they, you know, they, at the time being essentially a startup company, it was all very low cost commodity stuff as we know and, um, you know, they had to uh, be able to process all of that data as well though. Not good enough just to store it, <coughs> index it and, pr you know, provide a, you know, a basic search but, but also be able to uh, uh, rank it uh, and do other kinds of things. So. So it's, a, and it's actually a very complicated environment having all of the, the PCs, thousands of, of, of cheap PCs and, and so on. So uh, you kind of need some sort of uh, you know, solution is to have some kind of uh, framework that helps you do what you need to do with all of that data in, in a very simple way. And, and that's where MapReduce kind of came from. It's inspired by Lisp. I don't know if you know the Lisp language, but it has a lot of parentheses in it perhaps. Uh, if you don't know about it, you probably don't want to know about it. It's kind of quick con I find it complicated myself. Maybe some people find it straightforward. It depends. I think there are people that think in different ways and they find some things easy and other things hard. So, but, uh, so, so that's sort of where it came from. Uh, we sort of said some of these things yesterday that, you know, so some of the common data sources for MapReduce jobs are text files and click streams and, and geospatial information, that sort of thing. And sort of what you might be producing as you're doing some text mining and, or, 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 you know, building an index even, or, you know, prediction, all these kinds of things, you know, you can do uh, you know, with, with MapReduce. So if you haven't, anybody written MapReduce programs, you know, before? So one or two, few people here have written some MapReduce programs. That you, if you haven't thought about it before then you know this slides is really just an intro to, to show you what the kind of what you need to think about when you write these kinds of programs you need to essentially split the input data into pieces and apply a map function and it's all based on key value pairs so you sort of need you need to generate a key and and the key will have a value and then all of the pairs gather with the same key so the input data is whatever your data happens to be and then each of the nodes will do its own thing on a piece of the data somehow and, 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 and generate appropriate keys such that when all of this, so that the, the one key might be generated on a bunch of different nodes but they will all, end, that, that one key will all end up going to a single node that can then reduce or you know, combine and reduce the data um, from that. So you sort of need to think about how, what those keys will be and the values um, in order to solve the, the problem that, that you uh, are going to, are going to uh, address. Um, and, then, and then it gets reduced and you know, ultimately you, you know, it may well be that your whole, you, know, you might just be making a decision. It might be a decision function, right? A yes or a no based on a, a very large amount of data. So all of that has to come back to a single process perhaps at some point. It might not be. It might be that you're doing image processing and in fact you know, if it's very data parallel, so, so then you really you just break the image up into pieces and the mapping and then there's really not much reduction to be done other than just writing back the result all independently as independent parts of the process. So kind of a logical view of how you might think about it is you've got these independent inputs and, and they've been coloured in terms of keys and then um, you know, for example, all of the red keys are being sent to one node and all of the yellow keys to another node. And then eventually, so, so there's a c combining of all those keys, the reduction phase, and it's all coming back and, and going out. A, b a better example is, you know, if you look at word counting, which is just a canonical example, um, is that you have an input file, which is just a, a set of text lines. 
Each line has some words on it. It's quite typical and it's kind of the example that we will use. And it needs to be split up then, or it's in, indeed if it's very big, and usually it'd be you know, a gigabyte file, that's the size of a file we'll try with. Um, it's split up into, you know, into blocks, and, but then the, the individual block is read by some um, um, mapping function, which is then going to take each line and for each word produce a, uh, a key value pair. And here the key is the word and the value is just the, the number one to say this word occurred. <laughs> All right, and it, it might well occur several times on the same line, um, and you may just well admit, you know, the same word with your know, key one, 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 these three times. It might be what you do, and but all of the words with dear will, you know, end up uh, going to the same place. Um, so, so what there was, there was two of them here, and the, you know, sort of ended up going down here, and then, and then, so, so this is it's called shuffling. But so, so all of the data is transferred to an appropriate node, and then essentially using a hash function or something like that in order to identify for the given key where should where should it go, um, and then, and then they can be combined and added up, and then eventually it needs to be, you know, reduced into the final result, which is stored to a file. So this is kind of the process of, of doing word counting. Um, so, so what you have to do, you want to do, you're going to set up a cluster, obviously pull the data, you have to store the file that you're going to, uh, you know, process. You have to select the kind of data formatter. So when you're reading from the file, uh, you know, you can't just read in the same way for all different kinds of data. It will depend on what, what the file contents really is. You know, the, the file that we're looking at is a, a file, there's an ASCII file essentially where every line is a, is a, is a string, right? Um, but you might have other sorts of formats on the kind of data then you have, uh, you know, it, it needs to be split up appropriately and then mapped appropriately. So you need to write, effectively you need to write what will be the map functions, you need to write what will be the reduce functions, and then you sort of write a small thing to say this is the job, this is what the map and reduce is, and this is how we're reading, this is how we're writing, and then it creates a jar file which you sort of give to the, to the, to the system. So the framework will, will you know, distribute, it manages the, we've already talked about HDFS, um, it will schedule and distribute these mappers and reducers across the cluster for you. It will attempt to run the mappers as close to the data location as possible. So the, the blocks of the data on certain nodes of the system, then that's where it will put the mappers so that the reading doesn't require really much transfer. It will store and, and, and route the intermediate data from mappers to reducers, so it does all that sort of thing for you. It will even sort output keys and partition them. and It will restart failed jobs. So it'll it'll try to keep things um, alive. Here's a kind of a, an over, overview of the execution that you have a program that you submit and it, it, it basically the same program just gets replicated but you know at the map phase it's just the map functions that are being used. The, here's the input file that's split into blocks and for each block there's a mapper that's going to read through the file and, and um, uh, generate key value pairs that it will write to a local disk and that will be then um, read by the reduce functions from, from, from that. There's another diagram we'll see uh, that will... Uh, so, so that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, what, what, what happens. Um, and we sort of saw some of this history before, right, that, that uh, it came out of, of Google and then Yahoo and, and Facebook and others started using. Um, and, and there's a big recap in the slide set of Hadoop, but we just talked about yesterday, so we don't really need to go and say that what, what the, the file system and so on and, 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 um, and so forth. Um, there is, just like the, we talked the name node and the data node, we said a little bit that there's a, there's a the map reduce has a master node, it's got a lot of workers, it splits things, the jobs up into tasks, and it will assign them out to the workers, it just sends them out, just as you had a data node, there's a, uh, a task uh, uh, node there that, that can you know, receive the code and, and run it, so like this. So the task trackers, we didn't see last time, but you know, and, and they, 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 uh, they run the MapReduce jobs for us um, with a job tracker up here that's making sure that, that these things run and that they, they, get, they, they successfully complete whatever the task is that they need to do. If they don't, 
then you know, you can restart it or something like that. So if this whole whole node were to crash or the task tracker were to crash or something like that, then it can kind of be restarted on another node or something like that. Very similar sort of um, philosophy behind the, the design of the way this system works as is what we saw for the storing of the data. This is, you know, in Hadoop 1 that was just MapReduce, that's all you could do, but now they've sort of, in Hadoop 2, they've allowed other kinds of, they opened it up allowing other kinds of things other than MapReduce, we'll see later maybe Spark and other things that, that, that you know, for stream processing even or something like that, that, you know, it can build on top because, and then there's Hadoop 3 as well, right? So, so there's a bit of job scheduling, um, you know, one map task for every block of the input file. Again, the, the size of the block and the size of the files is kind of going to uh, dictate your parallelism that you get, right? So if your block size is too big or relative to your file size, or again, if your file size was too small, then you might not get a lot of parallelism in, in <coughs> at, the, at the mapping stage. So there's one map task for each block, and the user-defined number of reduced tasks, so uh, there doesn't necessarily need to be one for every block. It really depends on the function and exactly um, what would be the most efficient way to do. Um, but the reduced tasks read from every map task. So um, I think there's some diagrams um, here. We'll see in a second that that will help us kind of see what's what's going on. Um, so um, so the map tasks write their output to a local disk, um, just to wherever they happen to be running on, whatever the node that they're running on. They'll write output. Um, the, the, the key value is output written to a local disk. The reduced tasks then write their output back, though back to the HDFS. So ultimately, the you know the the input comes from HDFS. Something happens. The output of this job has to go back to HDFS. Only when it gets back to HDFS and the output is finished, if you've got a complete job, it's completely run. Um, otherwise, it's kind of uh, you know just partially run, and we don't really want you know, other consumers to sort of see parsley run things. There's a bit of fault tolerance in there. So this sort of explains a bit better, or at least depicts a bit better what is happening. There are map jobs that run. There are reduced jobs that run. They get scheduled, as we call them workers. So the map jobs are reading the blocks from HDFS. The map jobs are writing just those key value pairs just to the local disks. And then the reduced jobs or tasks We'll be using, you know, HTTP is very simple protocol to to get, you know, the appropriate data that they need and to combine and do the reducing functions. So it's a transfer then, like in a peer-to-peer -peer way between the nodes in the in the Hadoop cluster. And then the reducers uh, finally write write their answer to to the uh, HDFS. Um, now there's all different kinds of data flows you can think about, it's just purely data parallel where, you know, the, there's no interaction between the data at all here really that, you know, the data that comes in is just some, the same computation being done to different parts of the data and it's, as I said, like for perhaps images, you just do the same thing to each portion of the image, then, then there's nothing really much to do. There's this, in this case, there's kind of the same data, but there's lots of different things that are being done to it. This might be one block that's ultimately being read, but it's being there's lots of different computations. Here's kind of a multi-stage thing where something's been mapped out and reduced, and then mapped out again to another stage and reduced, um, and then a more complicated a kind of inverse tree where the re reduction may actually be a bit more complicated than just a one-stage com combination. But you know, having a tree, and then it may well be, in fact, that you don't know uh, in advance how many jobs and things, computations that you need to do. So it might be that you need to start up uh, more map reducing uh, functions as you go along. And then an iterative kind of process, but these things are a little bit more complicated to do. And indeed there was this chart, uh, kind of going a little, little bit quickly, but there's a chart, um, you know, in 2011, it's a little bit old, but sort of showing, you know, data parallel is quite straightforward and single input kind of gets a bit harder. The scatter gather, and scatter gather is very much the map reduce type pat paradigm, scattering the data out, having computations and having it gathered back. 
um, into a single point. It's kind of the moderate level. And then these other ones sort of become difficult to implement. You know, the MapReduce paradigm is not necessarily the, the best paradigm for everything that you want to do, but it does uh, uh, support you know, the great variety of things that, that people want to do today that provide results. So, um, so and I, I guess things are changing and, and you know, obviously people being competitive want to make sure that their system is you know, supporting a greater variety of things and, and, and more effectively. So uh, there were a bunch of slides in here about advanced MapReduce things, but I've kind of cut them out. But there's a whole heap of things that you could uh, investigate further if you're interested in, in if you're developing MapReduce programs um, to, to understand the, the performance and so on and what you're getting. We have a small uh, word count demo. These slides were actually written, uh, you know, at one point we thought that we were going to have you do these exercises. Right, each of you know maybe during the during the class or during the day somehow, but we realised that there was a lot more organisation required to to make that happen smoothly. So the slides are sort of written in a way that you know that that you might go through and do some things. Um, but what I will do is I will just uh, um, quickly demonstrate the word count, and we might have a look at the source code, a little bit of the code, just to understand the coding a, a bit before. So I'll just drop out of the slides. I'll come back to what we're familiar with. Um, which is the uh, a login to the to the DRC master, which I'll do now. Now we we have a couple of uh, uh, files that that uh, that we've I've already uploaded. They're actually on another directory here. Um, so so one of them's about. Um, you know, it's test two, which is about 1.6 gigabytes, and then I just doubled it in size. I made I made test two two, which is twice the size, 33.3 gigabyte file. So I, I, I copied them across already to Hadoop file system. They're sitting on the file system, um, and in in here, here, where is the file system page? So here is the uh, tip. You know what we saw before, and it's you know it's got um, 15 gigabytes worth of stuff there. On it, I mean, we can kind of interrogate that, um, and I put them in a directory called uh, demo map reduce. So, so they're there. Well, I'm just going to remove uh, the uh, outputs that I had run before. Um, Now we we can just have a look at uh, the file um, demo uh, test two, for example, uh, and have a look at the blocks. I'll just I'll make this a bit bigger. So it's got twenty five blocks, right? So. It's a bit bigger than the file that we were using before, 0 to 25. They're replicated three times. Um, so, so that file, we can um, uh, uh, have a quick look at it. Whoops, what did I just do then? I pushed some button. I won't cat the entire file, I'm just going to, you know. So it's just a text file, it, it, you know, it contains, it's like a book of some kind, right? So um, now we can, we can run our uh, MapReduce, you know, job to do word count on that. And I'm going to time it um, as well, so I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the timer function. So the way we do, the, the, the uh, code is... Uh, the jar file is inside uh, here. It's uh, Hadoop. Uh, examples jar. It's called word count. I need to give it the input. Um, what did I call it? Test two, right? And I need to give it somewhere to put the output. So I'll just call it output one. 
Uh, and we'll time this, we'll see. Does it work? So it starts running. While it's running, I mean, we can look and see that it's doing some sort of, you know, it's, it's it, you know, percentage, the time that it's taking to do stuff. But there's also a web page that you can get at, at you know, at, at the master that will provide you an overview of jobs that have, that are currently running and that, that you know, the completed jobs that, that you can see I run a few times before. Um, and then you can sort of have a look at, you know, that job as it's running, so it's 24% complete and, and, and so on. There's only one reduced task. There's 25 map tasks. Why are there 25 uh, map processes? Because there's 25 blocks in this file, right? So there are 25 blocks, one map process for each one. The number of reduced tasks is uh, user defined, so it was set in the program as one. Um, and I have a 45 node cluster. Uh, each of those nodes is uh, really just a single core, um, although the Hadoop is reporting a capacity of 90. Um, I think it may be because that single core is hyper-threading, so it's kind of seen as, you know, it's sort of seen as two, maybe, perhaps, um, by the system. So, but we really only have a 45 node cluster, and it's kind of getting through the job. We can see still doing the mapping phase. What I'm going to do next, when this is finished, which will only take a, a couple, of, a minute or so uh, to do is, uh, so I have a, a file that's twice as big and, and it's just the same file copied twice, but now I'll run that file. That file will have 50 blocks and you might think about um, how long do you think it will take to run com on this same cluster compared to this file, which is half the size. So it's doing the reducing now. So there's only one um, reduce function, run one reduce uh, task. And now it looks like it's complete. So that took two minutes and 45 seconds. So if I run, and I mean, I can look at the output uh, as well. I'll just do very quickly. Uh, 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 oh, I need to remember what it's called. <laughs> so I'll do a ls. I put it there. So it put its output. I'll, I'll, I'll make this all the way across. Um, so, so we could have a quick look at that output. You can see it's got a number there. You know, if, if you had multiple reduced tasks, they would all write to, to different files. And I don't just want to list everything at once. So, sort of. So, you know, it's tokenized, and, and it, it, you know, the tokenization is very primitive. These are just things that it found, and you know. Um, and as you go down, you know, through it, you, you'll see, it, you know, eventually it gets to, um, you know, so these are the starts of quotes and things in the text and, and the count next to it. And then there's numbers and there's other stuff. And it's, you know, it's a whole, all of the different tokens that we found in the text and the counts. Okay, so they're there. Um, but let's run, um, that was 2 minutes and 43, I think, seconds. Let's run the uh, other one, which is twice as big, I'll get to it. Uh, I'll just try to find it here. So we'll put that there. We'll put this here. So this one has 50 blocks. Um, so how long do you think it will take to run? Understanding that I've got a, a 45 node cluster, how many map tasks will it have? 25? Why will it only have 25? I have 50 blocks now because I've got a file that's twice as big. I expect that I'll have 50 map tasks, right? So there's one map task for every block. Now, uh, 
So you might think it will take, you know, so, so but I've got 45, I wasn't using the entire cluster before, right? So now I've got uh, uh, those 50 blocks are presumably spread over that cluster quite well. Right? I didn't see all the locations and see the actual distribution of the spreading of the blocks, right? Now presumably there's like a block, you know, on every, every node of the cluster. You can see it's getting through the, the, the mapping. Um, so, you know, if that's the case, then those 50 map tasks being spread out too as well should still, should be able to read all of that data. It's not quite 50, there's 45, so it's, you know, it's unfortunately we didn't have 50 nodes, but um, at about the same time as it took, you know, to read the data for the first one. So I've just got more, I'm just using more resources to read all the data in parallel, right? So I got, you know, I should, you'd think it would be about the same time, but the mapping is the one part, what about the reducing? There was only one reducer, and now it's, re is it reducing twice as much data, or is it, do you think the reduce will take longer, or tw should it take twice as long? It took about half the time, I think, if we were looking before, just roughly, you know, the reducing might have accounted for about half the time, so you might think if there's only one reducer, there's no parallelism, should it take longer if it's reducing more? You remember when we talked about sockets and I showed multiple sockets can have more bandwidth even. So, you know, the reducer has to read data from all of those nodes, but you know, where is the bottleneck is the question in your mind, right? Is it, the, is it the reading of the data in order to bring it all to one place and write it to the disk? Or is it the CPU for combining and adding up numbers? Or is it the writing to the HDFA? You know, what, you know, so to understand whether it's going to get a lot slower or not, these are the kinds of questions that you, you might think about. Um, but it looks like to me that the reducing is taking place quite, quite quickly still. We could have a quick look perhaps and just refresh on this screen and, and see. So this gives a lot more detailed information about what is happening you know, it's doing some sorting right now, copying and sorting. It does do sorting. We didn't see this graph before, but this is sort of showing how much is complete for the, for the tasks as they go. And there's a lot of other information here, a lot of timing information. I was just using a simple timing here. It took a, a little bit longer um, to run, but not, not like twice as long or something like that. When I ran it this morning, I ran it, you know, five o'clock or something. Um, it took three minutes or so for the first one and about three minutes for the second one as well. well it, you know, so the time can vary. Um, obviously, there's a lot of variation in these things. The, the nodes are spread on all different places around Australia and different you know, um, performances. It can depend on, on, on who else is using the cloud and so on and so forth, right? So there's a, there's a lot of sharing. These are all virtual nodes and virtual nodes generally, you know, they're going to be a bit slower and a bit more unpredictable than if you were to run directly on hardware, you know, what we call bare metal, kind of running directly on a machine, right? So, so it didn't really take that much longer. I, you know, I, I counted t a, a file twice as big, but I had almost twice as much resources to do that. Um, so, so that's kind of all, you know, I wanted to show. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it, it's fairly straightforward. You compile the program. Let's have a quick look at the the code, unfortunately not all the code is there. I sort of noticed that it's kind of a bit, uh, a bit disparate, but I mean, basically, you know, you know, a mapper, you know, a tokenizer mapper might look something like this, where, you know, this, this mapper is, is given that some text that would come from the, from the reading of the file and, uh, uh, you, you know, step, you know, just tokenized, very basic tokenizing, and then, you know, create a, you know, a word and, and then as the, you know, um, the word is just a piece of text as well, and then, and then they write that as the, here's the key and here's the value, and the value is always one, right? So it's just writing for every word, here's, you know, it's occurred once, it's occurred once, it's occurred once, go on to the next line that's given to this mapper, this get, mapper will be given a sort of line at a time, um, and then a reducer is going to be taking you know, a key, but now a set of values because it's, you know, it's got this key from a, one mapper, the same key from another mapper, same, you know, so, so there's a set of things that it's getting. What does it do with those? Well, in our case, it's just adding them up, right? It's just iterating through the values, add them up, and then create an out, output, um, which is, you know, the result, 
which again here, you know, the result is an iterable itself actually because, you know, because what we want to do later on with this um, create text, but writing again the key and the value. It's the same key this time, but now it's the sum of, the, of those things. So you write little classes like this and then you put them together into a main class which is a, you know, here called word count, uh, which is just saying, you know, here's a, a new job and, you know, here's the, the mapper, the combiner, the reducer. In this case, the combiner and the reducer are the same. They do the same thing. It's just that, you know, the output of the int sum reducer is coming into the reducer class. The output of this, which is, there's only one thing, but that'll be written to the output, the file output, rather than writing to the, to the, uh, sending it on. So it's kind of like, you know, these are, you know, I'm not going to go through and try to, you know, write programs with you today or something like that, but, you know, it's fairly straightforward to write this kind of thing. The word count is a very common example, um, you know, it's universal almost, right? But there are, is it quickly, a, just a, another example um, that we have a look at that you might try writing and implementing yourself. So for, so for consider Facebook, which has a, a list of friends. And a friend is a bi-directional relationship. So if I'm a friend with Udaya, then you know, by the relationship, he is also a friend of mine, right? So, so two people can become friends. So, um, and, and so a common processing request is that, you know, who are the friends in common? So who, between Udaya and me, who do I know that I'm a friend with that Udaya is also a friend with, right? That's what we like to find out. Um, and, and you know, so that when we visit someone's profile, we can write that information. These are the friends you have in common. So it doesn't change very frequently. It's not like people are, you know, friending, you know, every minute or something like that. And so, so it, you know, you don't have to calculate it all the time. You can sort of just calculate it at the end of every day, create a table and then look it up and then it should be accurate enough, right, for, for the purposes. So, so, so the way that you would... You know, think about this as it's just a big uh, sparse graph. And this is just a sparse graph notation. So from, you know, A has B, C, D as friends. Person B has A, C, D, E as friends. This is just a few people, but you could imagine there might be 100 million lines, you know, if, you know a very large uh, graph that needs to be processed. And we're trying to find out, you know, say between A and B, who are the common, common people, right? Who are the common friends, and not just for A and B, but for for all, for all of them, for everybody, so that we can create a master table that we can just look up, right? So each line is going to be an argument to a mapper, effectively. You would split it up. You know, this the big graph would be split up appropriately, and and the, each mapper would then read through each of the lines and create something um, that it would then send on to be combined and reduced. So what would that be? Um, what would be the, the question is what would be the key, the key that you each mapper will produce, so that you know you get the you, you get the appropriate combinations taking place. So here, for example, would would be what the way that we would do. So um, so to map A, B, C, D. So here's a relationship. So A is friends with B, C, and D. You can create these three keys. So a, A and B are friends, okay, um, and B, C, D is put after. So A, for, for, for friends A and B, these are the possible possibilities, right? For friends A and C that are in common, these are the possibilities, right? That could be, they, they could be in common. They don't have to be in common, but they could be in common. And then for friends A and D, these are the friends that could be in common. So these are all the same, right? It's just coming from the same relationship, but these are the keys and these are the values that we're going to send, right? So this one relationship generates three key value pairs. And then you can see for all the other lines, you generate the same sort of thing. Now, because it's a um, you know, bidirectional, the way that we're going to generate the key is that we'll sort the A and the B so that, so that for example, instead of writing BA, which you might think that we would write here, put B first, we're going to put AB so that this key and this information, this key value pair goes to the same place that this key value pair goes to so that it will be combined properly. Those two things, those two keys will then go to the same place. Same for all of the others, right? And then what we do, so then what we do is, is at the, at, at, you know, at the reducers, 
you just group them by their keys and, and you sort of get this, right? So A, B, you know, there's two things there between A and B. Here are the friends of A, here, uh, here are the friends of A, here are the friends of B, right? So it kind of comes like this. And then all that we need to do is find the intersection of these things. These are all now unique keys find the intersection of those two things and you get the friends in common and then write that out to your master, you know, your, your lookup file, right? So it's one way that you could find, find the friends in common. Well, compute the intersection. So then you, you, after the reduction you get, you know, you get the, the things in common, right? For, for each, each possible pair of, of, of people. You know, so you could try writing that and, and, and seeing, you know, the answer. It would be very similar code, somewhat to the word count, right? It's, it's the same sort of process. Um, so there are some limitations of MapReduce. It's batch processing. It's not interactive. Um, it's designed for specific domains. You know, like it, it doesn't work for everything. Um, I, I actually teach high performance computing and general parallel computing and parallel algorithms and doing all that kind of thing, which is much more general and, and, and you know, you solve all different kinds of problems and so on and so forth, right? But, so this is for a particular kind of domain. Uh, you know, it might be some training and it's, it's a moving thing too, right? So it's always changing. Um, we kind of did see this sort of um, comparison before, but, you know, it is designed for a lot more data. It's not interactive, but your traditional RDUBMs can be, you know, it's a write once, read many times, where these things are designed to read, write, and change, and so on. This is static, this is dynamic. Your databases will provide a lot of integrity. They have the ACID properties, but they, that costs in order to do that, whereas this has not a lot of integrity, really, in that sense. This will be linear scaling. We talk, you know, these things come from what we talked about before as well yesterday. So just as conclusion, the MapReduce has been designed to try to be easy to program. These two things go together. It's a distributed parallel processing um, platform. It's got fault tolerance. It's designed to be fault tolerant. We saw some of those things like the heartbeat and so on and how that works. How, you know, when things fail, what do you do? Highly scalable. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a popular framework these days, right?